Welcome into another edition of the Stripe Show podcast. It is Froggy Wednesdays, and we are into the best part of the PGA Tour season. I love the majors just like anybody does, but now it's the FedEx Cup playoffs. We have finally uh, reached the end of the regular season. The top 125 will play this week at the Northern Trust, and last week's tournament was amazing. We've got a guy joining us uh, that was a part of that tournament, is a part of this week's tournament, looks to be a part of the FedEx Cup playoffs moving forward. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome in Hudson Swafford. Hudson, thank you for your time, man. I appreciate having me. Two-time PGA Tour winner, including the 2020 Punta Cana uh, Corrales Championship, T2 at Congre. You've had a really good season, uh, but life on the PGA Tour, man, it is hard to win a PGA Tour event. It is. They uh, after I won my first one, I just don't, they don't give it away. I had chances prior to that, and uh, you know to finally get it done in seventeen, it was it felt like relief. But I didn't want to be just kind of a one and done guy. And right. I struggled with a little injuries and whatnot, a little self doubt, and then uh, to come back to uh, Pudicon in twenty twenty and uh, the fall and get things started off for this season on the right way with a win. It was, it was awesome. I mean, COVID kind of threw a wrench in everything. So the, the event in Punta Cana, you've played twice within what, like an eight or nine month calendar year. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty crazy. I mean, I know you finished, uh, I think you finished six there again when you went back this time, correct? I did. Yeah. I had a chance to win. Um, didn't quite defend. Uh, I didn't, didn't chase down, um, um, who won there. Um, uh, was it Damon? Yeah, Joel Damon. Yeah, oh. sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, oh. But yeah, trying to chase down Joel. Had a chance, but uh, fell a little short. But it was still a good, good defense. Yeah, this last week was a great tournament. I love the Wyndham. It's always good. People kind of jockeying in. And you see it as they're showing. The whole time you're watching the broadcast, you see guys, they're in inside the 125. They're out of the 125. Somebody like Chesson Hadling makes an ace. And gets in right on that 125 number. And it just it I think the FedEx Cup adds to it's just another layer that adds to the sport that we love so much. A hundred percent. I mean, that's everybody's goal to make Atlanta, right? And then uh, you know, you struggle throughout the year and you're coming to the Wyndham. Wyndham has so many mixed feelings. You've got guys that are in the top 30 that are just trying to improve, you know, position. You've got guys that are middle of the kind of the FedEx or, you know, play well there, go get some momentum going into the FedEx. You've got guys that are miserable right there on the bubble, trying to keep their job. And then you have guys that are just trying to maybe get to the corn Ferry finals. Right. So it, it, there's, there's emotions high and wide there. Some people are really happy. Some people are not having too much fun. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting event. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. You see somebody like Justin Rose missed it when Chaston Hadley makes that ace. Justin Rose missed the putt on 18. I actually was playing with him. Oh, were you really? Yeah. Now, now let me ask you this. In a case of, I know we're watching television. We know what that putt means. Yeah. But does Justin standing over that putt, does he realize I have to make this to get in? Uh, I'm not sure. I talked to my caddy on the 18th green, and I didn't know if he needed to make par or what I think a some lady might have come up to his caddy and maybe it told him what they needed to do. Um, so I, I wasn't a hundred percent aware on that. But you could look at the board and you could you I mean the projections were there. So you kinda you kinda had a feeling. Uh, you know, I think he was projected at his number it was fourteen under that right. he was projected just inside, maybe like one twenty three. So you got to figure. I mean, you lose forty FedEx Cup points. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, every shot is so important all year long. Like a, a little short four footer on a on a Thursday or Friday early in the year in you know February or April makes 100%. a difference when you're coming down the stretch at the end. A hundred percent. There's you can't take anything for granted throughout the season, or you're really tough yourself late in the year. How much of the six-man playoff did you get to watch? 
Uh, I watched it a little bit. I mean, because I, I was third to last group, so I uh, I went in. I was supposed to – me and a couple other guys were flying up together up to Northern Trust, and Kevin Kisner was one of the guys. So, I mean, Georgia guy, we're, we're close friends. Um, you know, after Adam Scott missed the short putt on the first playoff, I actually – went out and sat behind the uh, green, I guess, with his parents. And uh, then he had a great shot in there. And he'd, I played with him the day before. He'd been putting beautifully. I was like, well, if somebody doesn't make a birdie, I mean, kids is going to win. Yeah, so, I was surprised Adam Scott missed that putt. If you were watching the broadcast, everybody on the broadcast thought it was over. I mean, they thought it was a given he was going to make that putt. And he had seen – and what I thought was strange was – I think it was Siwoo Kim had a par putt on that same line that he did not appear to even take a glance at. It was like he had the greens book in his hand and he was making a decision on what his read was going to be. And then it didn't even touch the hole. I know. And that's where that's, he was right underneath it. Cause it gets tricky. If you get pin high or pass, it's super, it's a, the greens are really fast and there's a lot of slope around that pin, but he had it in the perfect spot right below it. But I mean, like you said, it's, it's just hard to win a golf tournament. And he's really he's done it, what, 13 times, 14 right. times? Right. So, I mean, he knows how to do it, but it's just it's just hard. It is. It was good to see Kisner get a win, though. One of you, like you said, your fellow Georgia boys, as much as that, I, I'll be honest. I mean, we, we were, we're doing really well here, but I'm going to go ahead and ruin it. I'm, I'm a huge Gators fan. So uh, I love yeah. my Gators, but I still so – I love to see Billy Horschel win. Uh, I'm sorry. And, but we need we need some more Gators on the tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't have many. You got a lot of your a lot of Georgia boys out there. We're, we're gaining a few more, which is nice. So it's uh, unbelievable. It really yeah. is unbelievable. But so the top one twenty five uh, played this week. Now you said I know some guys like we've had Chris Baker on. He's a friend of the pod. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Baker said he's going back to the Corn Ferry Tour final. So how does that work if you're outside the one twenty five? You so, you don't you don't qualify automatically for next year. No, you don't. So essentially you kind of lost your card, but if you finished 126 to 150, you actually have conditional status. So you would fall right behind the web category from the corn final corn fairy final, not the web, I guess corn fairy finals. Um, and the corn fairy guys that earn their card. So you'd be right behind the that category. So there's right. definitely events that will go deep. And you'll get in. Usually they get in anywhere between eight and 14 events, maybe. Right. Throughout the year. Um, but it is nice. You can kind of reshuffle in that category. You can, your points will accumulate versus, you know, having zero status and you would get no points for an event. So it's, uh, it's key just to have some status so that some people don't really realize, you know, I mean, finishing 126, yes, you lose your job, but a guy like Harris English last year, super close friend, he was – he had well, he was in that category. He finished – he played an unbelievable round at Wyndham two years ago – or three years ago, excuse me, to get conditional status, got into the first event, the Greenbrier, and finished tied second. And then I think he had like four top tens in the fall and ended up making the floor championship out of that category. So – I mean, so it's unbelievable you can do crazy stuff like that if you just have, you know, an opportunity. And those guys will get opportunities. But if you finish past 150, you have zero status on the PGA Tour. But you got you still have a chance to go to the Corn Ferry Finals, three events to finish top 25 and get your tour card back. Wow. So, but you're starting over. Those guys have been playing all year. You're starting over at zero. Yeah. Wow, that's tough. So you're you, you currently sit 56th as we head into the first leg of the FedEx Cup. So do you know when you start? Do you know about where you need to finish this week to assure that you're inside that top 70 for the following week? I don't honestly. I know it's three times points. I know my game's starting to come around and starting to do really good things. So I'm just I'm looking to try to get in contention like I did last week. Um, right. That's that's the only thing I'm worried about. Um, you know, I think I'll be close to good right now moving on. But, you know, if you if you go have a chance to win, then I mean, my goal, ultimate goal is to get to Atlanta. 
not just move on to next week. That's a case of winning takes care of everything. Yeah. If you get a, get in contention and, you know, feel the, feel the good juices going and, you know, you win one of these playoff events, it's a, uh, it's a big deal. So I have to ask, so the FedEx cup, when we started the FedEx cup system, it's been mm-hmm. tweaked a little bit every now and then, and everything gets tweaked to get better yeah. as you know, you, you learn about it, the more you use it. Um, do you feel the players have embraced the FedEx Cup system a little more where they're looking forward to it and they enjoy it and they're playing into it? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're playing for a lot of money. We're playing for – I know we didn't – none of us grew up, you know, trying to make a five-footer at our home course for the FedEx Cup because it wasn't around. But right. what FedEx has done for us and the tour and and the exposure they've given us, I mean, it's – it's a big deal. It's turned into a really big deal. So, I mean, yeah, you want to be in Atlanta. You want to be, you want to have a chance to hoist that trophy. I mean, it's, it has that major feel. Yeah, and um, it's also a case of there's still something to play for outside of this. And the, there's the Ryder cup picks, you know, there's going to be yeah. some guys that get in automatically, but then you Coach get Schreiber, hot. Yeah, he's you, going to make those picks. You get hot in the playoffs and you, I mean, you're playing that literally the best fields all year, right? These three, pretty right. much for the PGA tour top to bottom. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you get hot three weeks in a row and you're definitely going to raise some eyebrows on, you know, coach Stricker. So that's uh, definitely the goal. I mean, you saw that's what happened with, uh, with Billy. Yeah. Back when he won the FedEx cup, unfortunately he didn't make the team and they've now changed the rule to where the, yeah, they moved it because of that. After. Yeah. I call yeah. it the Horschel rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, and it seems sometimes it feels like the Ryder Cup means more to the Europeans than it does the U.S. It feels like I, is it that our fans don't embrace it? I, I I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but it feels like it means a little more to them. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I haven't played on a team event, but everybody that I know that plays on those team events, I mean, it's a big deal to them. Uh, Would it be a big deal to you to get on that team? Oh, Yeah. I mean, it'd be incredible to represent your country and and play in the biggest. I mean, that's the biggest golf tournament, I think. I mean, you know, right. you have the majors, but you get to play. I haven't played really any team event since college. You know, it's you don't you're not really pulling for every week. Right. You know, you're not pulling for other guys. I guess. I mean, you are if you're out of it and your friends got a chance to win, but. I mean, that would be that you miss that team feel and, you know, hooting and hollering and cutting up and rooting hard for other guys and watching watching the leaderboards of different matches or, or you know, just wondering how other guys are playing. I mean, I haven't had that in a long time. So it's uh, – I, I don't know what the deal is. I, I mean, I don't know if the Europeans are – they get a little bit more rested because usually during the Ryder Cup time it's – been a pretty busy time for the PGA tour guys. And I know the, there's a lot of guys on the European tour that play on the PGA tour that are on the Ryder cup. But um, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I can't, I mean, I'm like, you couldn't put my finger on it, I, but I'm not going to sit here and say like the guys are not as into it because it is they're into it. Yeah. I'm excited. I, I enjoy watching, watching Ryder cup and I enjoy the trash talking and back and forth and, and I, yeah. I really get into all that, but you know, you mentioned that you sometimes like to watch guys, your friends win golf tournaments. Do you watch much golf? If, if, if you've got a week off in your home, do you, do you follow the tournament that's going on that week? Do you watch it? Uh, I won't watch really till Sunday, uh, maybe a little bit Saturday afternoon, but I'm not going to sit there and grind on. I'll check on my phone, see how some guys do. Um, but yeah, I like, I like seeing people trying to win. Um, so, I mean, I'm not glued to it on Sunday, but, you know, if I have some friends that are in the hunt or whatnot, I'd definitely watch the back nine. And I, I do enjoy kind of watching people trying to win and see what they do and see, you know, how they carry themselves. Just see if you know, you never know, you might pick up on something when you're right. in that position. Right. Now, as you get ready for, uh, for, for this week in, at, at Liberty National, I know you've played some practice rounds already, ready, getting ready. Um, what's a golf course playing like this week? What are the keys to victory? It's good. Uh, it's a little soft. The greens are a little soft right now. Uh, hopefully the rain will stay away, but the golf course is immaculate. You're going to have to drive it well this week. 
Um, the greens are really pure. A little, they're a little busy. Uh, got some undulation to them. There's no doubt. Um, so you'll see a lot of shots get close. You know, a lot of good shots will be rewarded. Uh, you miss it in the wrong spot. It's going to be really hard to make pars. Um, so it's, I, I think it starts. You got to drive your ball well here because the rough is pretty penal. It's a lot right. of fescue. Um, so it's it's a, it's going to be a good it's going to be a good test. I'm I'm looking forward to it. I actually kind of I like the golf course. So a premium on fairways more than how far you can hit it. Yeah, for Cause sure. Because you you hit it in the rough. Uh, it, it's going to be really tough because a lot of the greens are kind of elevated and they got a lot of runoffs on them. So it's fairways are going to be a premium. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it seems we get away from that where it is just how far can you hit it, go fight it and hit it again. Yeah. But it's nice when it becomes fairways are a premium. It brings a different uh, group of guys into the mix that are able to win the golf tournament rather than it just being who can hit it the furthest. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. So moving into this week is, uh, as, as you work on your game, do you spend more time on your short game or do you spend more time on accuracy as uh, you, as you move into this short game this week? Um, I feel like I'm, my golf swings in a pretty good place. I'm doing some good stuff. Good, good stuff mentally with my uh, golf swing. So yeah, just sharpening up short game, getting ready for, you know, just kind of, you know, the battle, but, uh, just keeping that sharp and confident really right you know we've talked about you going to georgia and i I do have to ask how does a kid (laughs) from tallahassee florida i'm guessing you grew up a florida state seminoles fan yeah i i I did i wasn't like diehard seminoles but i i did yeah were you a diehard gator hater i was you were okay i figured that i I was actually pretty close with uh coach alexander buddy alexander who was there I told him early on that he didn't have to recruit because I wasn't going to wear orange and blue. But uh, his son, his son, and I are the same age. Grew up playing junior golf, and I've known Buddy forever. And I, I just politely declined. I go, and you have an unbelievable program, but I will not wear orange and blue if I'm good enough to uh, play college golf. Oh my goodness! So how does how do you end up in Georgia? Well, uh, Georgia had an incredible golf program when I was kind of growing up and coming through. And uh, my dad actually went to Tennessee. My mom went to Florida State. So I kind of oh, wow. just split the difference. Wow, that's awesome. So you really yeah. were. You were. You were. In, in the, so college football had to be big in your home. Oh, yeah. It was, it was huge. I love college football. I love college sports. I'm a huge sports fan. But uh, really, I, I needed to grow up, too. I, I tell I, Florida State's just a little too close to home. I mean, I didn't grow up too far from the campus. And like I said, I couldn't wear I couldn't wear orange and blue. And <laughs> Georgia just seemed like an unbelievable fit for me. We would have loved to have you, by the way. I mean, we really would have. <laughs> it would have been great. I mean, I'd love to be yeah. here talking to former Gator. Um, but talk about that Georgia golf team. I mean, the golf team at Georgia, I know when you got there, there were guys that were good. And then the time you were there, more guys came. Talk about that 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 experience of playing on that Georgia golf team. Oh, it was incredible. Hacker did an unbelievable job. We uh we give him a we always give him a hard time that he was the best travel agent recruiter in college golf. He didn't he didn't try to get in the way once we got there. He just surrounded us with really good players. I mean, when I my freshman year, Brendan Todd and Chris Kirk were seniors, then Brian Harmon was a sophomore with Adam Mitchell, who was a Walker Cupper. And another guy that was an outstanding junior golfer, Michael Green, um, who just kind of fought to get in and out of the lineup, who would have probably started at most every other college. Um, but it was tough. We, we had a, I mean, we, he surrounded us with great players, um, great golf course, and just told us to learn how to compete. And then after that, my freshman year, Harris English and Russell Henley came in. So we, uh, we, we had a bunch of good players. We had battles. We uh, He didn't give anything to us either. I thought that was pretty good. I hear a lot of stories now, like coaches will make sure they their studs are kind of in the lineup, even if they're playing bad. And Hacker, Hacker didn't cater to us. If you didn't finish top 10 in the previous event, you were qualifying for the next event. didn't matter. If you won a qualifier, if you won a qualifier and you'd finished top 10, then you could bank you know, getting into a next event, but there was nothing given to us. So he, I, I thought it was awesome. I mean, he made us compete and 
there there was great battles there was angry moments there were i mean it didn't matter if you were ranked number one in college golf and you missed out on top five you weren't going wow no it was just part of it it taught us how to win taught us how to compete and uh you know so it, it, he's had a lot of success with it. i mean i think he's got 12 guys on tour right now so it's worked did you have any idea obviously when you're in the middle of it sometimes you're too close to it to understand did you have any idea not knowing at the time you guys were all going to be tour players did you did you know how talented you guys were yeah i i mean we I knew we had a talented bunch. I mean, we obviously growing up with most everybody that lived in the Southeast from the Southeast, um, good players, you know, we had five all Americans one year. I mean, a couple years and, but the realistic, it's not like, well, yeah, all y'all will be on tour. That's not right. realistic, right? It's a different, it's a different animal. It's, it's, I mean, you're playing for your livelihood. It's a different mindset. You're by yourself. It's how do you handle travel, all that kind of chaos. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty incredible to see pretty much everybody I played with, except one guy who was a Walker Cupper and a stud amateur, uh, as one on the PGA Tour. That was pretty much consistently our team lineup. So it's, uh, it's pretty unbelievable. No, there's not too many programs or not too many guys that have been a part of teams that – can say that. No, that's crazy. So when you guys all get together and you're having your stories, what are one of those, what's one of those good stories that always comes up, whether it involves you or Harris or Harmon or, or Henley, what's one of those stories that always comes up every time? Oh man. It's usually something with our coach. I mean, just us laughing at him. I, I don't even, most of the stories I can't really say on air, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I got to come up. But I, we had such a great time traveling together we had a good group of guys that got along we we had fun i mean teams would go to events and grind we would go to we would go to events and goof off and just have a good time we, right. like we to start the spring season every year we'd go to puerto rico that was our first tournament back you'd see guys hit banging balls in the range and and practicing hard because they've been in cold weather and whatnot and we just spent the whole we would play our practice round as fast as we could and we'd go to the beach. Right. And so we just, I mean, there's not one particular story that stuck out, but it's just hacker kept it light. The only thing he really, really got on to us was about our grades. We had to, you know, maintain the highest team GPA for male, for the male sports. That's really what he stayed on. Awesome. Us about. Um, so it, it, we, we enjoyed it. We had a good time. We did fun things. We did, we did a lot of things that teams, you know, didn't do and, and couldn't do. And we were very fortunate. I like to hear that because coaches really like you're seeing it now. We're learning. Uh, Coach Bobby Bowden just passed away from Florida State. Yep. I realized uh, I'm not sure if you watched any of the funeral that was online. I saw I some clips and highlights because obviously growing up in Tallahassee. Yeah. Derek Brooks talked about how he got his first C and Coach Bowden called him in and said, hey, you're not you're not li living up to your potential, and he's like, "Are you sure you got the right guy? I'm playing great." He said, "It has nothing to do with the football field; it's about your grades." And so, these coaches really did seem to put such an emphasis on not just the way you played, but raising young men that were ready when they got out of college. Hundred percent, yeah. That's what that's why I think Hacker did an unbelievable job. I mean he he wasn't the guy that's going to be out there grinding on a swing, grinding on this. I mean he. He'd set up short game stations where we would compete against each other. Right. But, I mean, he's the world's best solitaire player, honestly, <laughs> and and a great travel agent. But uh, he uh, – great recruiter and uh, just helped us grow up. Right. You know, Which is key at that time. Yeah, 100%. I mean, 18-year-old, I mean – I'm five hours away from home. The only thing I want to do is go hang out, and do whatever I want. But right. he's kind of, kind of reined it in. And he, he did a great job giving us just enough rope to, you know, experience life and make poor decisions and good decisions and figure it out and, uh, and still be able to keep us at, you know, the top of our game and be one of the best programs. Right. You know, going back to how hard it is, to win on the tour do you have are, are there tournaments where you you play you're done you finish and you had well 
I wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done that. It's not necessarily a shot. It's more of a mindset or more of a uh, not taking a chance when you did take a chance. Oh, yeah. I mean, you always have doubt every week. I mean, last week, I first time I've really played really good in a while since Congaree, honestly. This year's kind of been up and down. It's kind of been feast or famine for me. But last week was something that I hadn't seen in a while. And my ball strike, I mean, I've been kind of just struggling with – um, kind of my face and controlling my golf club. And I really played well last week. And then on the weekend, and I, I'm a pretty good putter, but my speed was, it was not very good. It was, it, and I lost by whatever, five, six. And I mean, it was one of the worst putting weekends in my PGA tour career, like just on the weekend, I played really nice the two first two days, but I, I, it was kind of just a little baffled. And I mean, I wish I would have spent a little bit more time maybe after just doing some of my speed drills. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I could definitely look back last week and just be like, man, you know, it, it would have been very easy to just been in that playoff. Right. Um, but you always – I mean, there's, that's golf. I was talking to some buddies after, and it's it's part of golf. It is. So, Who, who's your swing coach right now, Hud? Uh, working with John Tillery. Um and he's really helped me out. I actually parted ways with my longtime coach, Scott Hamilton, this year. I got in some bad habits and just couldn't seem to get out of it. And it was one of the hardest things that I had to deal with because he's a close friend. Um, I've spent a lot of time with him and his family. And it was it was difficult, but at the same time, he wanted the best for me. And I just told him I got to go hear something different for a little while. And, right, just a different message. Yeah, and – JT, for whatever reasons, kind of got me back in the groove and back in a good place and mindset and uh, believe in what I'm doing now and I'm doing some really good stuff. What are some things you guys are working on? Like, is there, or, or, is there any one thing he changed that really was like a light bulb moment? Uh, kind of my sequencing. I, I was just lifting the club up. It wasn't, there was no real body moving the club. So we got that. And I, and I'm a fader of the golf ball. So, I had always played kind of with a shut face and kind of held it off and just hit like a bullet fade my whole life. And mm-hmm. for whatever reason, starting late fall, my club face got kind of open and I'd never, and I had never played with an open club face and it was, it was a struggle. I had no clue where the ball was going to mess. And that's tough when, uh, <laughs> when you're trying to get the ball going where you're looking or right. trying to hit a shot shape and, you just don't know where it's going to end up. And I, I was really at that point. I really didn't – I take pride in my iron play and my, you know, my ball striking, and it was a real downfall. And uh, But now we've really cleaned up the club face. I've got a lot more control over it. It's uh, way more solid at the top, not wide open, and uh, I feel like I can compete again now. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's, 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 we've all been there obviously at a much lower level with you playing professionally, but you get out on the golf course and some days you just feel like you can't miss. And in other days you feel just so lost. It's just, you, you yeah. don't have a clue where it's going. Yeah. And you don't feel like you're doing anything any different. No, it's so crazy. It's like, how, how can they be hitting it so bad when I feel like I'm doing exactly the same thing I was doing yesterday? A hundred percent. And And people don't obviously see like how much goes into body stuff because I mean, you're just trying to feel consistent day to day. I mean, with as much travel as we have, uh, as much, it it sounds great. All my friends give me a hard time. It's like, you just play golf for a living and that's going to be really easy. And I told them, I go, why don't you take your golf bag and walk for five days out of the week for two weeks in a row and give me a call when you're done. Right. And let me know how you feel. Right. And nobody will do it. And it just, it, the wear and tear and what you do and, you know, trying to feel consistent. I mean, it's just like anything else. You age a little bit, you wake up and you're just a little yeah. tight and sore and the swing's going to be a little different. Your speed's going to be at a little different spot. So you just kind of try to adjust. So right. it is. I mean, it's, it's obviously a blessing to play golf for a living. Oh but yeah. At the same time, it is a job. It is work. Yep, a hundred percent. So it's really, honestly, with JT and I, we've gotten to do a lot more stuff in the gym, little stuff, mm-hmm. 
um, little stuff that's boring, but kind of translated what I'm doing in my golf swing and helps me um, make it a little bit more repeatable. So that's been, that's been a real big key. It's amazing how big uh, fitness and in the gym has become a part of golf. And I know that a lot of people like to just point to Tiger Woods as he was kind of the first person that brought that into our sport. But HUD, what's something that you would say is a, that an, an, an average amateur should work on in the gym that would benefit them on a golf course? Uh, body control and stability stuff. I, it hits so overlooked. Um, I was actually having a conversation with Lucas Glover about this last night. I can't remember the guy he was telling me, but he works with Colby Wayne and Jim and he works with Colby works with all a bunch of different athletes, baseball, football, golf, everything. And he said he had this football player coming. Lucas after his session, Colby's like, look at this guy coming in. I just, just look how big this guy is and a freak athlete. And, um, yeah, I know he played offensive line for the Seattle uh, Seahawks, and he's like, and he saw him. He's like, "Well, how can this guy ever be bad?" And he's like, "The stability stuff that we do and the body control movements that, like Lucas does. I mean, the guy could not do it, so he couldn't control his body. So he was getting pushed around by D linemen, and Colby just grinds on that with him. But that's kind of I work out with a guy at home, Tom Hemmings in Sea Island." um at the resort and that's kind of what we've become more aware with, of got away from olympic lifting but and doing more stability uh body control yeah we we do push some weights there no for sure but the more that you're aware of like your body control staying in sync uh staying in balance it's it's huge like it's one thing that gets overlooked. It's not, it's not the sexy workout. It's not fun. It's boring. It's, it's not something that most people think of, but if that's the biggest thing to golf is being in balance and in control of you. Right. So core strength is more important than just like pushing weights with your arms or your legs. A hundred percent. I've got a buddy of mine that has really taken up yoga and does mm -hmm. a lot of yoga work. And yeah. he says it has improved his golf swing tremendously. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to gain control of your body and body awareness, and you're going to be able to balance so much better. And honestly, speed comes with balance. I mean, you need to be able to swing hard and fast. You've got to be in balance. If you're all over the place, I mean, you're not going to hit it straight. You're going to, you're going to make high numbers. So, yeah, being being in balance, being aware of your how your body works, it's it's huge for golf. Yeah, it's almost like the average guy goes to the golf course, he just wants to go to the range and bang balls when that's not really where it's at. He, the, the guy that's spending all this time on the short uh, short game area is probably going to benefit more where this is the same way. You can go to the range and go to the gym and push weights all day. Yeah. But this kind of stuff here doesn't look sexy but it's going to pay dividends when you get on the golf course. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, bench pressing 225, it's fine. I mean, look at it. I mean, that, that'd be, that's great to do. You're going to look great on the beach. You <laughs> over there with like a light dumbbell on one leg, trying to balance and not fall over. I mean, that looks terrible. People are going to look at you kind of, kind of weird, but I mean, that's, that's kind of where it all begins. That's awesome. I'm glad you're seeing results from that. You know, I know you're a, uh, one of the PXG guys, we had Wyndham Clark on last week. Yeah, he, he talked a little bit about PXG and exactly how it's changed his his game. But the PXG fitting experience seems like a completely immersive deal when you're going to go get PXG golf clubs. Hey, they're they're unbelievable. They they go above and beyond. They um, they I can't even give them enough credit for how much work they put in with me doing getting the clubs just right fitted for me. Uh, from bounces to lies to different club heads, the movable weights in the back to get it right. Um, their stuff is pretty good. It's 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 unbelievable what they what the technology they have, um, how much passion they have for it. I know there's plenty yeah. of club companies out there that have that passion, but um, you know, as a tour guy going to them or even a regular fitting person, they kind of take it the same. It's they want your feedback and what what you think, and they'll they're gonna do their damnedest to get it spot on. And uh, 
they've done a phenomenal job. I've only this is my first year with them. Obviously, Wyndham's been with them a little bit longer, but um, they they've been nothing but accommodating and gone above and beyond to get me the right stuff and good stuff. So it's been, it's been great. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what you played before, but was the fitting experience was it like a wow moment when you when you got fitted for these clubs and see the different things they can do with them? Yeah, it, the different stuff that they can do with them and their the way they make the golf club. It, it's pretty impressive. They do it a little different than uh, most, and they can design it in the computer and print it out and have a model and tweak wow. and and whatnot. And then everything can come out the same way every time. So it's really, I feel like it's really hard for a lot of companies to make the same club over and over. And they, they've figured out how to do it and it's pretty incredible. That's awesome. So, um, before we let you go real quick, enough golf stuff, let's get in to what's important. We're about to kick off sec football season. Yeah. No, you're a big Georgia bulldog. Uh, my Gators did get one on you last year. We had one, one, mm-hmm. and I, it felt like forever. They did. Um, they whipped us. Are you excited? And let me ask you this, because I, I know you're a little bit of a Falcons fan too, being in Georgia. Is it difficult for you to pull for Kyle Pitts, knowing he was just such a great Gator, but now he's on the Falcons? Ah, uh, no, I mean the guy's a stud. I, he's I, unbelievable, I, by the way. I really, I really enjoy watching like unbelievable athletes. I mean, uh, honestly, I'm not even a diehard Falcons fan. I'm kind of a fair weather NFL guy. I really follow Georgia guys, but I really right. like watching some of the top athletes when they get drafted and seeing how they do at the next level it's uh-huh. and i mean especially i mean that guy even though lewis seen knocked him out of the game i mean that guy torched us that was a hit um, man it was yeah for both of them i'm sure they yeah. neither of them really knew what was going on after that yeah. i'm just glad i don't play football because of that yet <laughs> but it was i mean the guy's a freak obviously yeah. um yes. and I, i'm excited to see what I mean, I I know Matt Ryan, and I I could imagine he is thrilled having him there. So. Yeah, I'm a I'm a as you can see, I'm a Buccaneers fan, and yeah. uh, we we had a great season. I still <coughs> two things I still don't believe. I still don't believe Tom Brady's my quarterback, and I still don't believe we won the Super Bowl. But I was there to witness it in person. My son and I went, but I don't I do not look forward to playing Kyle Pitts twice a year. I'm hoping our linebackers can uh, can at Step least pull down a little bit. Um, you've got to be excited about Matt Stafford making the move out to Los Angeles. Oh yeah. I mean, Matt and I were the same year. Um, it's, it's awesome. I get away from Detroit a little bit. No, no harp on Detroit, but I just, ever since Calvin Johnson kind of yeah. left, I feel like, I mean, they've never, they've never really had a running game. Um, since Barry Sanders left. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm excited for him. I can't wait to see what he does. Um, you know, Sean McVay's offensive genius, right? Uh, Stafford's going to have some great players around him. Yeah. Unbelievable defense. So it's going to be really cool to see him maybe make that later in life push. Um, obviously, the guy's made crazy amount of money. It's not really in it for the money now. No. So we, you can go play and you try to get that ring and see, see what he does. And it's going to be I, – I mean, I hope they have an unbelievable season. So – I'm sneaky kind of a Rams fan, I guess, this year watching him. But yeah, I'm a little worried about him. I'll be honest with you. I think, <laughs> the, I think the two teams we're going to have to contend with, we always – it doesn't matter what happens with the Saints. We always have to worry about the Saints. Yeah, um, unbelievable I'm, I'm, program. I'm concerned about the Packers, obviously, with Aaron Rodgers returning. I know they've got – they want to get one back on us. We beat them yep. twice last year. And I'm concerned about the Rams. Uh, I think they're going to be very good. The defense is great. And, uh, like, Stafford is – he's a hell of a quarterback. Yeah. Will you yeah. get too many Georgia games? Uh, I haven't quite matched up the schedule. I don't – I'm not going to get to go to the Clemson game, first game of the year. Um, a friend of mine offered me a couple tickets to Arkansas in another game. and I Got to go to that one. They'll beat Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. um, so, as of right now, I'm not committed to go. Uh, hopefully, SEC Championship, I'd go to that game. But, Wait a second! Uh, now you're not, there's no there's no guarantee you're going to go to the SEC championship. I mean, if we beat the Gators, we'll be just fine. <laughs> now, but, will you go to Florida, Georgia? I think I'm out of town. I think that's oh, yeah. the week of the Japan event, honestly. Um, but if I'm in town, I will go to that game. Yeah, that's always um, a fun game to go to. It is, yeah, yeah. Exciting atmosphere. I mean, obviously, living in St. Thomas, it's 
hour drive for me. Right. So, um, no, I, if I'm in town, I would go to that game. But I, I love it. My wife and I, we always make it to Athens, usually at least one time a year. We didn't make it during last year, the pandemic, obviously. Right. But uh, previous to that, we just we've made it every year, at least one one home game. But um, yeah, it, I've kind of compared, and it's I, I play a lot in the fall because most of the golf courses are Bermuda. That's kind of what I grew up on because right. those are warmer areas. So I play a lot in the fall, and then I take a little bit off on the West Coast. So that's kind of where we're at. And, uh, you know, if it does match up correctly, then we'll definitely get to a game. Now, speaking of the uh, fall series, obviously you're playing this week at the Northern Trust, looking Mm -hmm. to play, obviously, the next two weeks uh, at the BMW and then at the uh, Tour Championship in Atlanta. What's your schedule moving forward after that in the fall series? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have a quick turnaround. Um, I mean, Ryder cup pinning, if I got hot, I need mean, I need a lot of help to get on the Ryder cup team, but, uh, you never know. Yeah. And, um, but I, I'm looking to start back in Napa the week, two weeks after a week after the tour championship. And then, uh, I'll play probably four in a row right there in the middle and then kind of see how I'm feeling. After that, start coming back a week off, and then Jackson. I'll start back there and play a couple events in Vegas, and then uh, and then the RSM is uh, right right there in your backyard. Yeah, right in the backyard. Yep. And I always play. I always play Mayakoba. Unfortunately, last year I couldn't make it because uh, kind of tweaked a rib. But uh, I'll be back there this year. Um, that's kind of one of our favorite vacation spot of the year. My wife's favorite hotel, and and. Uh, vacation spot so usually i'm playing my co but just it's a great vibe it's a it's a vacation vibe with a little golf mixed in there well as we're sitting here talking to you i just got a a notification that says patrick cantley gets the okay from tiger woods to use joe lacava on his bag as uh cantley's regular caddy matt minister is out because of covid19 so joe lacava will be on cantley's bag this week i saw a picture of that and i was wondering i was wondering where revy was uh I didn't know where Matt. So I guess he got COVID, huh? Well, well I'm hope surprised. a speedy recovery. But um, last time somebody asked for permission to be on somebody's bag that was Tiger's caddy, Steve Williams got the old heave ho a couple of weeks later. Yeah, but yeah. I guess uh, I guess Joey Lacava is safe being on uh, Cantley's bag for for a weekend yeah, or two. I think so. Well, Hudson, thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed it, and uh, good luck in the FedEx Cup playoffs. As you move forward this week to the Northern Trust and next week at the BMW, play well enough, get into the Tour Championship, and like you said, who knows, anything's possible moving forward with the with the Ryder Cup and all that. But thank you so much for your time, man. Absolutely. Appreciate having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. We're working on Webb Simpson next week here on the podcast. And then we've got uh, Hudson's good buddy, Harris English, will join us the week of the Tour Championship. So make sure Very you nice. tune in. Thank you guys for listening so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Stripe Show podcast.